close calls, near death, scary situations. We're talking to a veteran fighter pilot who thankfully has had more than nine lives in the hangar. I used to be a well-respected member of the aviation community, and then I started flying a Cirrus and that changed. <laughs> oh, that was great. Until the engine quit. And all of a sudden I see these explosions and these trees exploding. I'm walking away a better pilot because of this discussion. Hello and welcome to In the Hangar. I'm here with veteran F4 Phantom pilot, Gary Flagger. Gary, thanks for being here with us today. Oh, Dan, pleasure to be here. And welcome back, I should say, because yes. uh, it was a great episode that we had you here uh, before. But what I want to do now is let's just go into stories because you've got a few. Got, got a few. One, when you fly 170 missions in, 170 missions in Vietnam and instructor pilot in South Carolina for three years and then in England for four and a half. You experience a lot of uh, different events. So. You, you tend to catch up on, on some stories. All right, well, you know, let's just go into it. Tell me, uh, are we going to Vietnam first? Let's, uh, let's start with Vietnam. And like you said, I've used nine lives and <laughs> some of those missions, I think I told you before about the B-52s at 30,000 dropping bombs when I was at 1,000. <laughs> trees exploding all around us and um, one night I was in the uh, flight ops planning my mission and we got a call that the aircraft that had scrambled on an alert mission had uh, aircraft problems at the runway so would we plan the mission and go fly it so we quick changed missions and uh, jumped in the airplane and flew it was up at the Iron Triangle which was a pretty hot spot and uh, we were flying infrared, which means we had to do a about a 10-mile sector and photograph it all. And you know, night in South Vietnam, you just fly 360 knots, so pretty slow, just kind of. 360 knots, pretty slow. So much for my 210. <laughs> by the <clears throat> by, the third leg, I'm looking out and I said, uh, they're shooting at us. So we did the next leg at 420, and I said, now they're shooting at more of them are shooting at us. So we kicked it up to uh, 480, and we flew the last four or five legs at uh, 600 knots and uh, called back and said that uh, whatever they targeted us for was uh, very, very active. And to, uh, you know, we think we got the whole target area, and when we got uh, on the ground, you deploy your drag chute and pull off the runway, and the photo interpreters come and they pull the uh, film out of the camera and then you go back to the photo lab and we walked in there were about 15 20 people there they were on walkie talkies and they were lobbing artillery into that site already so that's how active it was and a friend of mine flying the F100s got shot down there the next morning so that's wow. uh, you know and one interesting flight and so. was that the Tet offensive that was coming in at that point or something else they uh, it was one of the biggest finds of munitions that they had in the uh, South Vietnam, they were gathering up. I think there were you know, thousands and thousands of troops had gathered there. So wow. we went in and, and broke that up. So I said, uh, Jimmy Stewart gave me a medal for uh, that mission. So Jimmy Stewart, the actor, was over there? He, he was over later, and he's a uh, general uh, in the National Guard. So That's he, right, I forgot about that. He was presenting general for, for that medal, so that was quite an honor. Wow. So, so I had one that was even uh, probably worse than that one up in uh, North Vietnam. We were, again, targeted for a, a night infrared run, and there was a road and a river running along up in uh, North Vietnam, and we came in at uh, 600 knots, and we're at 2,000 feet, and we dropped down to 1,000 feet, and kind of going through the the mountains and all of a sudden the fire started and they lit it up brighter than a stage at midnight and the tracers are going by and air bursts around and we're bouncing around and we flew right through it. I just said, this is it. There's no way I'm coming out the other side of this. And, and we did. You just go, wow. You know, I don't think of that one very often because it kind of shakes you to your core. How, how long were you in that? kind of way too that. long <laughs> <laughs> you know at 600 knots probably not long but uh a few seconds or, um, yeah maybe second or two but oh that's 
Wow. It's, but it's... Uh, well, we talked to, to a psychologist um, on a previous show, and, and as we were talking to him afterwards, he talked about how in, in these situations that the brain, I forgot the term he used, but the brain just slows everything down so that your memories end up, it, it feels like it was minutes yeah. when it was only yeah. a few seconds. Well, because I can remember looking out, I remember looking at the air bursts, like looking at my clipboard, and it was just like this much light. So Wow. That was pretty scary. How many were on that sortie? Um, just us. Uh, us, mean just you and your... Yeah, um, so just one airplane. One airplane. Yeah, we flew solo most of the time. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, and what else? And, and then, uh, I, since right after pilot training, I went to France, and De Gaulle said, uh, you know, NATO, we don't want you anymore, and, and kicked us out. So we went to Vietnam, and I had uh, nine months in France and about eight months in Europe, because every 20 missions you flew up north, they took a month off your tour, because mm -hmm. uh, 100 was kind of a lucky number. If you could get to that, uh, you, could, you couldn't go home, because I think the odds of getting shot down were 100 to 1. So, uh, so they gave you 100. That. So I was in uh, flight ops one night, and uh, the general would come down, and he had to fly so many hours, and he was getting ready to fly a mission, and. Uh, he got sick. The standing Val officer that was his IP got sick. So they said, Lieutenant Flager, would you get in the back seat with the general? So I said, sure. So we took off and he had a mission up in the, in the DMZ area. And it was, again, it was a night, uh, thousand foot flight. And, uh, and with a general? He was in the front and I was in the back, back seat. Uh, two star. Two star. Yeah. And on the Third, it was night and it was a little bit of weather, and on the third leg that we flew of about 10 legs, he got vertigo. And he said, we're gonna have to abort the mission. And I, I said, no, sir, I got the airplane. So I grabbed the stick and I was flying it with my elbow and running the cameras with my other hand. And I flew three legs and uh, he says, uh, Lieutenant, my vertigo's gone away. Is it uh, okay if I fly the airplane? I said, General, this is your plane. You, you do whatever you want. So he flew the last three legs, and when we landed back at Don Sanut, uh, the crew comes out, and you know, with the general, you get the staff car with the flag on it and everything, and uh, they pull the film out. We wrote the airplane up for you know what was wrong with it. And then we drove up to uh, the photo lab, and when we did, probably 30 people came running out. And I thought, well, that's the difference when a general comes to the photo lab versus a lieutenant, lieutenant. or a captain. And so we're walking up, and the chief master sergeant says, Lieutenant, this is the first time the general's ever gotten a target, you know, 100%. Because, <laughs> you know, if you get vertigo on the third leg, you're not going to get it. No. So guess who flew with the general for the next three or four <laughs> times that he flew? And we were at the villa one, uh, towards the last flight, and uh, he said, Lieutenant, where are you going when you finish Vietnam? I said, well, I'm either going to go to Texas or to South Carolina, because personnel said we've had people in the Air Force for 12, 13 years. They haven't had an overseas tour yet, and you've already had two. You're not getting three. And so we're talking, and he goes, see this bar napkin? He said, write your name and Social Security number down. And uh, he said, do you think there's anybody else that would like to go to England or Germany? And I said, yeah, General, everybody in the villa. He said, well, give me a few more names. So I got them. We wrote our names, Social Security numbers down, gave it to him, and I went to England. <laughs> so, you know, it uh, gets back to it kind of helps who you know. It's not necessarily what you know, but uh, who you know. Why was a two-star flying in an F-4? Um, they have to get... Uh, Flight hours, even even fly, like in military action, actual mm -hmm. hostile yeah. situations, yeah. the two star still has to get his time yeah. in. Yeah. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, they they maintain a certain level of efficiency. They're always flying with an instructor pilot. Okay. So. Wow. Except in that case, they were flying with a lieutenant. <laughs> you weren't an IP. Oh, that's right. You weren't an IP because his IP got sick. Yeah. Right. All right, well, okay, so that was, uh, you, you've already gone through a couple of cat lives. Uh, what do we have next? 
Um, the next one was kind of a fun one. I was flying a t test flight in uh, England, and it was on a cold December day, and you know, most of the time we flew the F-4, it had a big centerline tank with 3,000 pounds of fuel in it, and the wing tank on each side and it weighed another 1,800 pounds. So you had a lot of drag and uh, a lot of weight. And when you do your functional test flight, you fly a clean airplane. And uh, I was flying one that had a rudder actuator change. And on the F-4, the rudder actuator is like a, a low speed where it's easier to push and a high speed where there's a lot more pressure on it for you. And the dash one says keep the airplane below 275 knots because that's where the rudder kicks over. If it goes hard right or hard left right after takeoff, you're, you're kind of in a world of hurt for a while. So <clears throat> I got out to the end of the runway ready to take off and the crew chief said, sir, the plane's leaking the hydraulic fluid out of the struts. And I said, well, you know, it's cold, it's 28 degrees out there, the uh, gaskets have shrunk, it's gonna leak until they cycle a little bit. And he said, but sir, I can't let you go. So taxi back in, the tech gets on, and I said, you know, you know why this is leaking, don't you? Yes, sir, but we have to stop it. So he uh, wiped it off and they heated it up some. And So meanwhile, I'm burning more fuel and more fuel. So I get, get out to the end of the runway and uh, about a 15 knot wind right down the runway and a cool temperature. So I roll it and light afterburners and it's clean and it's light and it's cold. And so I just kind of went like this and pulled it straight up. And I thought, well, I'll just keep it below 275 knots till I get some altitude up there. So I go up to about 17,000 feet and roll over and we're upside down looking and we're looking right down at the runway. And, so I told the navigator, look at that, we're straight over the base and we're at 18,000 feet. <laughs> so I get back, we, we you know, went out over the North Sea, did our uh, complete check and came back and I've got the uh, colonel's staff car waiting for me. Well, the, you know, the language was a little strong. <laughs> what in the heck were you doing? You were still an afterburner and the general, the new general is already on the phone chewing my rear end out. He wants you in his office at 8 o'clock Monday morning. So that was my introduction to the new general at the base. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so wow. That was, that was a, an interesting one. So um, another one that I flew, you know, sometimes pilot cause their own issues no. when they're flying. <laughs> rarely, but they yeah, do. Yeah, rarely. Well, there was a... Uh, competition in Europe uh, called Royal Flush where like 17 NATO countries compete and uh, as a crew you have to fly up to the target and you have to tell them what's there and identify everything and normally when they're doing that it'll be a couple tanks out there a missile launcher you know something small and my target was a command post communication site and usually that's, in those competitions, it'll be a couple of jeeps with an antenna sticking up the back in the tent, and that's your communication center. And the target was in the Netherlands, and we're down at 500 feet, and we're flying along, and I'm looking out there, and I go, there's a great big antenna tower out there, like 1,500 feet high. And I said, okay, um, my navigator was, uh, was Al, and I said, Al, either to the right or the left of that is going to be our target. So I'm just going to stay right here. I'm not going to go after the big tower. And I'm flying up, flying up, flying. I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. And I don't say anything else. And I said, Al, since we're here, it's got to be that TV tower. So I'm just going to stay down here and roll up on my side. And we had a camera that shot 180 degrees. So I just went by that tower like this and the guide wires came right over the canopy. I went, <laughs> yeah, but I said, did we clip it? Did it, you know, where did it go? And so. You magically went in. Between the tower and the guide wire. Oh my God, at probably 300 knots. 360. 360, yeah. Wow. So that was, uh, that was an interesting one, too. Did you take out the communications post? Um, we got it, in fact, when the PIs that were looking at the 
film, they said, we've seen a lot of photographs of that tower, but we've never seen one where we could see the paint peeling off <laughs> the, the particular <laughs> bolts. <laughs> the paint peeling. So I said, would do me a favor and cut all of that film out and burn it, get rid of it. <laughs> well, want, you, you meant to do that, that, right? One. Yeah, yeah, something like that. So. Wow, wow. Yeah, yeah. Then in the military, you have a uh, operational readiness inspection once a year, and there's pretty tough criteria. You have to fly so many missions, your plane, planes can't break, so many of your crew have to be on base at a certain time. And we had a four-day exercise, and it came right down to the last two flights that we flew Thursday night, and I was one of them. So I got home about two in the morning after that uh, week-long exercise, get home about 2.30, quarter to three, and uh, six o'clock the phone rings. And uh, it's the flight commander, and he says, Gary, want you, we want you to go into crew rest. I said, I left the squadron three hours ago, and you're calling me to tell me you want me to go into crew rest. I said, that doesn't make any sense. Well, we'll call you when we need you. Okay. So, Wait, go, what, what's crew rest? Um, you've got to have a 12-hour window. Okay. And you just, you know, and you stay, just stay, three stay, hours. stay in notice. I mean, I don't have three hours of sleep when he called, yeah. Right. So it was summertime, and England, it's light, so I... I'm laying there tossing to turn. What the heck do they want me to go into crew rest for? So I said, I think I'll just go play nine holes of golf. So <laughs> got in the car, went and played nine holes of golf, and I thought, okay, I'm tired now. I got back home and jumped into bed and put my head on the pillow and ring, ring. Uh, we want you to come in now. I said, is this for real? Yes, we'll see you in 20 minutes. So I had to get a duffel bag and I threw three flight suits in there and some socks, underwear, and extra pair of boots and zipped up and went into the base. And I said, what's this about? And they said, uh, go into uh, the intelligence room and you're gonna get a briefing and the colonel and the general are doing your flight plan. I said, the colonel and the general are doing my flight plan. So I go into Intel and you always get some kind of a briefing when you're, you're going into those type of situations. And so he starts briefing me on uh, Russian destroyers and Russian carriers and their naval anti-aircraft guns and uh, missiles. And I said, you know, this is all really interesting and it's things we don't normally deal with. Why are you telling me this? He said, sir, I don't know. I said, this doesn't make sense. So I go into the uh, flight planning room and the colonel says, here's your flight plan, you're going to Avianco, Italy. I said, what's going on? He said, you'll find out when you get there. So I get in the airplane, take off and go down there. So all we know is we're going to Avianca, Italy. And we get down there and uh, what was going on, the Russians had developed some nuclear submarines and there was a nuclear sub-attender in the Mediterranean, which was a violation of the uh, SALT agreement, and it wasn't supposed to be there, and the Navy couldn't find it. So we were to take off from Avianca, refuel, and they sent a old KC-97 prop refueler that could barely fly fast enough to keep us uh, airborne, and so we're flying like this, mm -hmm. trying to get fuel from it. In fact, the gentleman behind me uh, we had weather around, and he bent the uh, probe and didn't get gas and had to land at a uh, alternative base. Wow. And uh, so we did that for a couple times. And the Mediterranean, just a great big body of water. And uh, one night, we flew it three different nights. One night I flew it, all of a sudden this green glow came up on the canopy. And what the heck is that? And, you know, St. Almost Fire, have you seen that where it just kind of... I haven't. I, I don't there. think I go fast it enough wasn't in that, my centurion. And it, just, it just glowed, and it just kind of kept following me. What in the heck is that? So anyway, <clears throat> because of the confidentiality of the mission, we couldn't even talk to anybody in Europe. So we had a, a radio that was a uh, FM uh, long-distance radio, so we called in to Washington, D.C., the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and said, da-da-da-da-da-da, and I said, you know, we don't know if we have anything but you know we had our infrared cameras going and uh, 
we got back to the base and lo and behold there was the uh, nuclear submarine and the tender and so they uh, developed that film, sent it back to Washington, had the ambassador in their office and he said, no, no, we don't have a submarine, we're just testing the tender to see how it works and he said he laid the desk, the photo on his desk in front of him and he went, oh, well, I wasn't aware of that. We'll get it out of there right of the way. So, <laughs> so that was quite interesting. That wow. was uh, really... When, about when was that? The early 70s? That was about 69, okay. 70, right, yeah, right in that spot. Wow. So that was, <clears throat> that was fun. That was, you know, again, you don't know if you've found anything until you get back and they going through the film, seeing if there's anything wow. on it, so... So that was on the interesting side. Well, then we went back to uh, South Carolina where I was instructor pilot, and you think you've done everything in the airplane, and students will put you in situations <laughs> where you've... You, Didn't know you it could do that. You couldn't, yeah, your plane couldn't get there. I always wanted to spin the F-4 because I love spin spinning the T-37s. Okay. And when we got over to England, um, the Navy had done some spin tests, and they lost the F-4 on the last one, and they even had a spin chute that the pilot could pull a lever and it would shoot a capsule out mm -hmm. and pull the anti-spin chute out and the plane would point straight down and then they'd release it and then they couldn't get out of it. But it was oh, wow. so, okay. so fast and violent going around like this, it wouldn't come out. So after seeing that film, I decided that's probably not a good thing to... Uh, so you never, to, you know. never spun the... Uh... Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Intentionally, I never spun it, but uh, uh, we were out over Myrtle Beach doing a missile uh, supersonic attack, and we were doing like Mach 1.3, so you're doing about a thousand miles an hour, and I was flying with a Colonel that earlier I tr tried to wash out of the program because he wasn't qualified to be flying the F-4. He, his thought process was back at the F-86, which he was transitioning from and not at an F-4. And what you do in the F-4 when you're supersonic, you cannot move the stick. So you have to fly it with the rudders and that's how you maneuver the airplane. Oh, wow. The, compressed air going across those wings is just violent. And uh, we were about 20, 21,000 feet, and he's coming in at 1,000, and we're sitting here at 1,000 miles an hour. And it, with a stick full back, supersonic, you can only get about three Gs on the airplane. So we were pulling about two and a half. And so he's coming in on us, and I'm sitting here watching, watching, and, what you want to do is when that plane comes by, you want to do a reverse on them and get behind them. And so I said, all right, Colonel, get ready, get ready, get ready, reverse. And he took that stick and slapped it full left. And that airplane departed. And so we're out over the water. You got blue sky, blue water, and a mist out there. You couldn't see the horizon. And so we're doing this and I just, Colonel, I've got it, so I yanked it out of afterburner. So which way's up, which way's down, you know, at a thousand miles an hour, you don't have a lot of time. Going, oh, I hope this is up. And so I started pulling and uh, ended up pulling about nine and a half Gs to oh, wow. uh, get out of it. And he passed out in the front seat, even with a G suit, uh, you know, at seven, eight Gs, there's the and extended like the that. The pull yeah. of the blood out of your head is severe. My vision went from this to this, and I could, you know, everything was tumbling and looking at the altimeter. I knew I was something like this, but I just didn't know which, where, or what, or, or how. And so we pulled it out and uh, declared an emergency, went back to the base and said, we've overstressed the plane because the plane was built to hold seven Gs max. And uh, they had the helicopters up, fire trucks and everything. We can go in and land, no incident, and get back. And the chief master sergeant comes up the ladder, and I hand him my helmet, and he says, uh, Captain Flager, you're the luckiest pilot in the world. And I said, why is that? And he said, come here, I want to show you. And this horizontal stabilator is about inch, inch and a half thick. And 
80% of the rivet heads had popped off and it was double wow. the size of normal. So that, uh, looking at that just, uh, again, chills up and down my back because uh, those things could have come off there just as easy as stayed on. So Just a little bit more G's and yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so those were pilot induced. Mother Nature took a shot at me too. I was oh, going, really? I, I was Mother going Nature. into uh, North Carolina with a student in the back seat, and we were letting down, and we're about 1,500, 2,000 feet, and all of a sudden this bolt of lightning goes right by the airplane and hits this tree down here and blows it up about three quarters of the way uh, down the tree. But I was close enough to it that the charge came in my elbow, froze my hand, the charge went up my arm, and my hair just stood up inside the helmet. And, oh, wow. Yeah, well, I was right. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. So those are some of the interesting events of, uh, you know, thousands just and a, thousands of hours. But most just of them a day in a life. And a, most and of them are just routine, and they just go as planned. But... Uh, there's, there's some that uh, you kind of remember when you sit down and think about it. So You ended up with how many hours in the F-4? About 2,500 hours. 2,500. So in those 2,500 hours, those are some pretty amazing stories. Yep, yep. It, was, it was a good airplane. It was, uh, wasn't really work. It was just fun flying every day. So. Well, Gary, thanks for coming and sharing uh, with us your stories. Oh. Uh, it's just... It's, it, just awe-inspiring what you guys have done. So sure. thank you. Thank you for having me on. All right. And thank you for watching. I uh, hope you enjoyed the stories as much as I did. If you did, like, share, and subscribe. And we'll see you next time in the next video.